As we head into March, 12 games to go. The three teams at the top of the table are separated by just two points. Liverpool are top with 60 points. Man City are second with 59 points. And Arsenal are third with 58 points. Let's start with Arsenal, who are chasing their first title since 2004. James, can they win the title with the attacking options they have? They can. Um, it would be difficult to sit here and say anything otherwise, considering the way they've started the calendar year. I mean, they've they've won all six league games, uh, aggregate score of 25 to 3. They put six past West Ham, five past Burnley, four past uh, Newcastle. Uh, you know, and, and just looking at the numbers, you'd have to say that they are showing that they've got the firepower to to compete with with the uh, with the other two sides. I mean, they've got the best goal difference um, uh, out of all of them now, out of every team in the league. So, the problem is, I think, if you start to just scratch the surface of those numbers and you look at obviously Burnley are struggling at the bottom of the league, West Ham are an enigma really at the moment they 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 uh, really capitulated in that game and there's obviously every game is effectively a referendum on whether David Moy should should stay or or go as manager um and then you look at Newcastle and you think well they're not they're not quite the same um combative defensively disciplined robust side that they were um earlier in the season or certainly last season and and, and you can you can start to kind of pick holes in in, in some of, of Arsenal's form but having said that their their attacking play has been been fantastic. Um, I have to say that you you look though and you think, well, when Gabriel Jesus is out injured, um, and even when he's there, you think, well, maybe they do need to sign a number nine. Do they do they have that clinical goal scorer to match an Erling Haaland or a Mo Salah? Um, particularly when it gets to you know the nitty gritty to the running and, and the games get tighter and, and there are fewer chances to come by generally in matches. Um, you know, they don't have a lot off the bench when Jesus is injured. You know, they've got Eddie and Ketia, but uh, Mikel Arteta seems quite reluctant to use him at the moment. They're playing Trossard through the middle. Obviously, Martinelli could play there. Havertz has played there as well. So they do have different options. I'd, I'd say they're not as a compelling an attacking unit as, as perhaps certainly Manchester City and probably arguably Liverpool as well. Um but they're showing in recent weeks that you know they're creating enough chances that it almost doesn't matter if they've got a clinical goal scorer because eventually they're going to take them. Mark, if we take a look at Liverpool, um, obviously they've had a lot of injuries, um, a lot of key players out, but they have this kind of um, spirit behind them. They're fighting for Klopp. When they're at Anfield, they're almost unstoppable. It almost feels like almost destiny that they, they finish this part of Klopp's career on a high. Do you think that they are a team that can hold on to their lead at the top of the Premier League and hold off Man City and Arsenal? Yeah, I think Liverpool have got all the credentials you need to win the title. And I think, obviously, they've got the game against City at Anfield in just less than two weeks. So that, that for me, is the game that will decide who are the title favourites. It won't decide the title, but I think if, if Liverpool come out of that game having avoided defeat, I think I think they're the favourites. I think, yeah, they have got a big injury list right now. I think 11 first-team players, as we we speak right now and missing, and that's that's a massive injury list. You know, most of the teams couldn't cope with that. But as we saw in the Carabao Cup final, they've got this crop of kids coming through that have, have served them really well. But I think, I think certainly maybe four or five of those players will be back soon. I think people like Mo Salah, Dominic Shaboslai, obviously Diogo Jota is facing a bit of sat down the sidelines. Maybe Darwin Nunes is back soon. I think they're going to have people back that are going to make a big difference. And I think once they come back, that will make Liverpool even better. So. Liverpool have got a lot of things going for them. You know, that they've been down the track before. They know how to win a title. They've got players that won't be nervous or looking over the shoulder when the title running starts. They've got Anfield, which is a big factor. You know, a lot of opposition fans won't like it, but Anfield does have a big impact on Liverpool's performances and, and their position. And I think the Klopp factor is massive as well. I think I think we saw at the weekend how, how much the team is unified playing for Klopp. You know, a lot of managers aren't very popular with the players. You know, it's no secret that, you know, football management is a tough game because you have to deal with the squad of, and get ticks and doubters, but that whole Liverpool squad is totally behind Klopp. And they've got goal scorers. I mean, that, that for me is the big thing. They, you know that Mo Salah will get a, a win out of a bag. And as James was talking earlier about, about Arsenal, yes, they've scored lots of goals and the top scorers in the league right now. But when it comes down to those games that are really tight and tense, and it's last 10 minutes, it's nil-nil, you need a goal. You know Man City going to score one with Erling Haaland, Julian Alvarez, Kevin De Bruyne. You know Liverpool are going to score because they've got Mo Salah, they've got Shaboslai, they've got Nunes, they've got all these players. I'm not sure about Arsenal, but I think with Liverpool, you just know that everything you need to win a title is there. So, yeah, I do think they can go all the way. And I think, for me, they're the favourites. Then if we look at Man City, the kind of 
we're coming into that period where they come into their own. And we talk about Arsenal probably adding a little bit more control this season. And then we've got Liverpool's firepower. It feels like Man City have all those things and the experience. Rob, do you think the inevitable is going to happen and the City will make that charge towards the title for a record fourth time? I think so. And I think the favourites for, for very good reason, because we've seen time and time again that they just keep grinding out these results in the, the second half of the season. And other teams, other challenges just can't live with them. Um, you know, that the entire way that Pep Guardiola sets his team up from the summer, from the start of the season, is to, to focus on these final months of the season. Um, he's happy for, for his team to drop points in the first couple of months of the season because he knows that usually they're, mm-hmm. they're behind fitness-wise, that they're not perhaps as, um, as match ready as some of the rivals. He's prepared to, to sort of drop behind in, in the title race in the first couple of months of the season on the understanding that when it comes to sort of February, March, April, that they're going to be right in their stride. And I think he's become a master at, at managing the squad in, in those final months. Um, you know, when you get other teams like the Liverpool and Arsenal who are kind of trying to battle through games week after week, Pep Guardiola isn't really doing that. His team aren't training really in the week. Um, they're having very, very little sort of preparation for games. It's, it's literally just game and then rest and then a game and a rest. And, and that entire squad have become very, very comfortable with, with that kind of rhythm. And, and if you look at their history over the last couple of years, you know, since 2018, if you, if you forget the COVID season, which was obviously delayed, in the, in the other seasons, in March, April and May, they've lost six Premier League games in all of those seasons combined. And four of those came in 2021 alone. That just tells you that they don't lose games in these final months of the season. And, and other teams, other challenges, whether it's Liverpool, whether it's Arsenal, anyone else, just can't live with that relentlessness of, um, of a title charge. And I think probably we're, we're going to see that again. You know, you could probably make an argument, maybe, that, that going deep into the Champions League and maybe going deep into the FA Cup maybe would cause some kind of distraction. But again, we saw last season that they are capable of, of winning absolutely everything. In the final months of the season last year, City didn't drop any points at all until they were confirmed champions. They, they drew, I think, at, at Brighton. They lost at, at Brentford, but they were already champions. They won every other single game that they had in that title race. And that just shows you how good they are at managing these final months of the season. And yes, you know that they've lost a little bit of experience with Mares leaving in the summer and, and Gundogan leaving. But they're primed for, for this time in a title race. And, and you know, Liverpool and, and Arsenal, well, Klopp and, and Arteta would never admit it. But experience in these kind of situations matters an awful lot. And City have proved time and time again that they can do it. And I think it would be very, very silly to look beyond them. Do you think we would be having a different conversation if Arsenal had been able to strengthen their attacking options in January? If they'd been able to buy a Tony or another striker, a Vlaovic? Would we be having a different conversation? Would we then consider Arsenal a much stronger proposition. Is that the thing that they're missing? And had they had it, will they now look back at January and think, maybe we should have done something there? Well, they, they uh, possibly. I mean, they they couldn't really do very much in January. They would have not been able to get an Ivan Tony deal over the line in January for FFP reasons, really. <clears throat> I suppose they could have been more adept in the market and maybe tried to move a couple on. Say they could have tried to shift Eddie Ketty and maybe... Uh, Smith Rowe, maybe one or two others, fringe players, Fabio Vieira, maybe, and sort of said, "All right, we, if we're going to go all out for a centre forward, we could raise some money that way." But you know, the January market, the guys know, was very stale anyway. I mean, there wasn't really a lot going on across the board. So to try and to try and do a deal of that magnitude and and, and as creative as, as they would have to have been to get the finances to be able to pull it off. You know, I, I'm not sure they'll they'll regret maybe the mid season if they don't win the league. And look, I mean, they are they are they are an elite number nine. Sure, I think that's that's fair to say, and it is a position they're going to look at in the summer. So they, to some extent, they know it. Um, but you know, they didn't. They lost the league last season because they ran out of steam, and I wouldn't describe them as bottle jobs in the uh, in the Gary Neville vernacular. But but there was a question mark over their mentality right at the end of the, of the season. You know, they lost to Lever to injury. They were eight points clear at the start of April, having played a game more than City. They lost to Lever to injury. And there, there was a piece I did on the site at the end of last season, which which um, ran down the numbers of just how many minutes Bakayo Saka, Gabriel Martinelli and Martin Odegaard in particular played. And then you compare that with the wide players, City, with Grealish, with 
um, Bernardo Silva, Mares, you know, all, all of those guys. And and the numbers were so much higher um, for for all of Arsenal's players. You know, I think that, I think Premier League the player who played the most minutes last season for City was Rodri, and it was a I think he played it from the top of my head. It was about two thousand six hundred minutes. Saka was well over three thousand. Arsenal had quite a few players at, uh, around the three thousand mark. You know, De Bruyne, Haaland were, were were way lower than than where you might think they are, uh, with the, or they would be given the importance that they have to those sides. So. I, I think it's a, firstly it's a squad depth thing with Arsenal. I'm not sure they can cope with one or two injuries in the same way um, that City and Liverpool have. You know, you think about Liverpool have obviously already lost Mo Salah for, for to, the, to Afcon. Obviously, they've got a lot, a lot of players out at the moment. You know, City have already had two months without Haaland. They've had longer without De Bruyne, and yet both of those teams are still ahead of Arsenal, who have had one or two of their own injury problems. Urien Timber losing him in pre-season was a big blow, I think, to, to Arteta's plans in terms of the way he wanted the team to play. But if you think of the core the core of that side, you know, Declan Rice has been available basically for every game. Saka pretty much every game. The two centre-backs are probably the, the, the best centre-back pairing of, of this season in Saliba and, and Gabriel. Barely missed a game between them. You know, they've been they've been pretty lucky to have that core group together. And they're going to need to keep that group together in the run into, I think, to have any chance of overhauling the top two. So there's that part of it. And then there's the mentality side. And, you know, the fact of the matter is they just didn't handle the pressure of the run in, you know. And, and you think about, you know, Rob talked very well there about City's experience and their know how. You know, when they beat Arsenal 4 1 at the Etihad, it was men against boys, really. It was, it was, OK, lads, well done. You've had a good season, but now we're going to put you in your place. And it was the, the gulf in sort of authority and and um, command of the situation that night really sort of showed a gap between those two sides, which again is understandable given how successful City have been under Guardiola and how, kind of how ahead of schedule Arteta has got Arsenal. The key is, or the key question is, is have they closed that gap? And obviously with Liverpool in the mix there as well, with Klopp kind of filling that gap with his own force of personality with a younger group who obviously not many of them have been the distance, although they've obviously got several players who have. So I think those are two bigger questions than whether Arsenal have got um, enough enough firepower. I mean, I think if they don't win the league, that will be an obvious area to look at. But it's really a case of do they have the squad depth and do they have the mentality to keep the form they've got going now? Because they're the form form team, they're the best team in England right now, but we're in the end of February. You know, if if they're still pulling this off come May, then they've won the league. And if they don't, then I think it will be down to those issues rather than necessarily solve because they don't have a number nine. Absolutely. And now if we look at Liverpool, a team that definitely have the mentality, they've won before. They've got this terrible injury crisis. They're relying on players with not a huge amount of Premier League minutes under their belt. Mark, do you think this young team galvanised galvanized by the Carabao Cup final, feeling that confidence and belief and with Klopp behind them, do you think they can see Liverpool through to the title? Uh, yeah, but like I said earlier on, there's a lot of players coming back soon, so I don't think it's an issue. They're not without these 11 players for the rest of the season, so I think it's just a short-term issue and I think they'll be fine to get through that that short-term gap. I think they've got Forest at the weekend. They've got City the following week after that. I just think Liverpool will overcome this little wobble in terms of injuries and be fine. And I think we have to accept that you know nobody did any business in January. City didn't, Arsenal didn't, Liverpool didn't. So it's not like one has had an advantage over the other. So for me, I just think you have to look at the pedigree. And I think Liverpool and Man City have both got players and coaches who've won the title. I think that's their strength. I think Arsenal's weakness is the fact that you've got a group of players who are obviously very talented and they've got a great potential, but they haven't been... Well, they've been tested and they faltered last year. And I think the same applies to Mikel Arteta. I think I think Mikel Arteta is a he's obviously a talented manager, but he's a, he could be Arsenal's biggest weakness at times because the way that he over exaggerates issues on the touchline. I think he looks he, he can lose his emotions at times, and that reflects on the team and the players as well. And I think we have to question Arteta. We don't question Arteta enough in the sense of he's won one FA Cup. I think in his time at Arsenal, he's built a team, but I don't think. When it comes to a title race in the last eight or nine games of the season, he is the guy that has the the cool-headed mentality that you need to to win a title. I think the jury's out in Arteta. I think he's done a good job, but you know the jury is out in the sense that he's built a team. But can they go that final step? Liverpool have done that under Klopp, and it took him a while to do it. It took him about four or five years at Liverpool to get there. But the signs were there. I think much clearer than they are with Arteta. 
and there's nobody doubting Guardiola because we know that Pep Guardiola's you know a genius. He's one of, he's one wherever he's been. So there's no question marks there. But I think Arteta, I think for me, he's the guy that Arsenal need to look at and think. Is he the guy that can get us over the line, or is he always going to be a nearly man? You know, look at Pochettino. Is he, is he one of those? Is he a guy that, you know, talks a game, has a big reputation, but will he deliver? And I think we have to see the answer to that, and I haven't seen it yet. We we discussed briefly before Klopp and how that might galvanise the team, but you know, this is the kind of um, we are entering, if you like, the business end of the season, but we haven't got to the really crunch games and. Is there any danger that this emotion all behind Klopp, will that weigh heavy? Will the pre- will the pressure become too much for those players at Liverpool? Yes, it's great now. It's spurring them on. But in those big games, when it's within touching distance, does that pressure weigh too heavy? I don't think it does. I think I think what we've seen so far, I think they've been energised by it. I think, you know, Liverpool's a really strange club in the sense that it's a, it's a club that kind of uses the emotion to propel them forward. It, we, we've seen it in the past where they tap into that emotion that, that you know the so-called twelve man Anfield. There's no pressure, I don't think, from the club situation. It only makes the that the Liverpool a harder team to beat or Anfield a harder place to go. And you know, and I think the way that he's done it as well, club has made it a lot easier for Liverpool to blank that pressure out. You know, he, he's addressed it, he's dealt with the issue, he said we're not talking about it again. And I've been to a couple of games at Anfield since then, and, and obviously at Wembley at the weekend. There's there's no sense that uh, an impending doom over Liverpool. It, I think everyone's kind of really energised by the prospects of winning four trophies. So, in many ways, that could be the secret ingredient in Liverpool's bid to win all these trophies, the fact that they've got Klopp on his way out soon and everyone wants to give him a send-off, you know, the players and the fans. So, I think it's the other way. I think it actually helps Liverpool to, to get over the line. I think it gives them that extra edge, that extra 1% as we talk about. And Rob, you talked about how Man City have experience in this running. They've been there, they've done it. Um, they know how to handle the pressure. And March... Is such a huge month for them. They have Man United at home, Liverpool away, Arsenal at home. They're away to Brighton. That might get moved because of the FA Cup and they have a Champions League game against Copenhagen. But three of three big games, three, two of them against title rivals. Can Man City wrap the title up in March and and, and put it to bed? Yeah, I mean, if the, if the fixture list stays the, the way that it is now, if that game isn't moved because of the FA Cup, I think if they come through March unscathed, they win the league. You know, they've got those four massive games. I think if they take 10 points from those four games, so three wins and a draw, they win the league because there's not there's not much to worry City in the remaining games. I think they've got a trip to, to Tottenham in April, um, a place they've already won in the FA Cup anyway. Mm-hmm. But besides that, there's really not much to worry City um, from the end of March all the way until the end of the season. So I think if they come through March um, unscathed, I think they win the league. I think they could probably lose a league in, in those four games. I think if, if anything's going to happen to City, it's going to happen to them in March. In my mind, there are two things that, that, that could stop City winning the league. One is they really struggle through March and, and those you know those games being back to back to back with no real sort of freebie in between, it takes its toll and maybe they, they lose one and draw another one and, they're a little, and they slip a little bit behind. The other issue they've got is obviously a massive over-reliance on, on Rodri. You know, a lot is being made at the moment about how they, they missed a lot of players at the start of the season. They, they didn't have Haaland for a big spell. They didn't have De Bruyne for five months. And, and John Stones, the best part of three months, um, were all ruled out. All those three players are back. Um, but if they were to lose Rodri, that would be absolutely disastrous. And we've already seen early in the season that um, he was suspended for three games and City lost all of them. And that tells you exactly how, how important he is. And you, know, you can make a case that they could probably replace Haaland with, with Alvarez. They've got players who can compensate for the loss of, of De Bruyne and, and John Stones. They've just got no one who can do that, that Rodri role. Um, you know, they've let Calvin Phillips go to, to West Ham and, and Pep Guardiola didn't trust him anyway. If, if Rodri was to pick up an injury, even for sort of two, three weeks, and he was to miss four games, you know, that would really put a massive dent in, in City's title bid. So if you're looking at for reasons why City aren't going to win it, and I think there's a compelling argument to suggest that they are going to win it, but if you're looking for a reason or reasons why, it's that really, really tricky period in March that you just mentioned, and also the the reliance on Rodri. Um, you know, as I say, you, if Rodri stays fit, you'd expect City to to motor through those games in in March, and and do what they need to do. Um, particularly because they don't really have to worry about that Copenhagen game. You assume that that Copenhagen tie is pretty pretty well wrapped up given they won 3-1 in, in Denmark. Um, so I would I would expect City to, to come through March unscathed and pick up the points they need. 
but there is there is something to be said for for those games, those tough games coming back to back to back. That it is it is very very tough, you know, to play United and all the emotion around a, a derby. Um, United have already been to Anfield and, and you know pulled off a surprising result and, and got a nil nil draw. Brighton can beat anyone, particularly down at, at the Amex. Um, you've also got Arsenal at, at home and, and City at, at Liverpool. Liverpool. City don't have a great record at, at Anfield, so if they are going to slip up, you imagine it's going to be in March. For those teams coming to the Etihad of the games that you've seen City lose, how do teams get at City at the Etihad? How do they beat them? How do they overcome the control that Guardiola will have his team exert on, on whoever comes to visit during that period? I mean, you can't, I mean, for all the success that they've had and, and how good they've been um, this season and, and last season, you can get get at them. You know, they play a very, very high defensive line and, and in, there have been games where they don't put enough pressure on the ball and they come against, come up against a team who have got that quality just to flip that ball over their high line. They've got pace, perhaps out wide, and they score goals. I was at St. James's Park, actually a game that Newcastle ended up losing 3-2, but Newcastle scored two identical goals where they had that quality midfield just to flip the ball over City's high defensive line. Um, they worked the ball out in the space behind one of the fullbacks. The, the Newcastle players cut in and, and scored, and it was two identical goals. And, and, and the same with the, the game against Chelsea at the Etihad, you know, a game that finished 1-1. But for the best part of an hour, Chelsea were probably the better team. And again, they had, the, they had a lot of joy doing exactly the same thing, flipping that ball over City's high line and having runners that go beyond City's defence. You know, in that game, Chelsea didn't take as many chances as they should have done and ended up hanging on for the last sort of half an hour, 20 minutes and drawing 1-1. And we're probably quite fortunate to get away with a, a one or draw. But, you know, there is a blueprint there to get at City. And, and, and they have at times in different games looked very, very vulnerable. And that's probably one of the reasons why Rodri is so important because it's, it's fine playing that, that high risk, high reward, high defensive line. But the one thing you need to have is pressure on the ball in midfield. And for little spells of games when City haven't got that pressure on midfield and, and the other team, the opposing team, have got that quality of pass and, and pace out wide or pace up front, you know, City do look vulnerable. Again, though, the problem is that it's quite hard even to score sort of one or two goals against City. But City have got the, the capability going the other way to score four, five or six themselves. So it's not a case that City are overly reliant on keeping clean sheets every week. You know, because they've got Harland up front who can score three goals in 20 minutes himself. They've got Foden who's scoring goals. They've got De Bruyne who can create goals out of nothing. So it's not like they need to keep clean sheets to win games. And, and actually, if you look at the table, um, out of the three teams we're talking about, City have scored the fewest goals and conceded the most goals. But yet we're talking about them now as, as favourites and far away favourites. That just shows you that it's not just about their ability to, to keep clean sheets or to score goals. It's just about their ability to do what it takes to win games. And they've shown it time and time again. Just Rob, I just wanted to ask him because that mentality that you speak about with City, do you think they do you think they look at Arsenal any differently now? Because I, I I remember having on the tour last summer and I went on pre season tour with Arsenal, speaking to a few of the executives who, who kind of gave me the impression that the year before when they when City sold Arsenal Zinchenko and Jesus, there was kind of a yeah okay you can you know you you can go and have these two lads we don't need them you won't bother us it'll be fine. You know, and obviously Arsenal massively closed the gap, took everyone by surprise and ended up being City's main rivals for the league. And it sounded as though I think Arteta would have been quite keen to take one or two more if he'd had the option. I'm thinking how Cancelo in particular. Um, but from what I was told, City kind of gave them short shrift in that they seemed to look at them very different. There seemed to be a different dynamic now. There was kind of like, all right, we have to take these guys seriously. They're not just another team in the Premier League. They are, they are actually our rivals. And I, I just wondered if you felt that in your conversations with people at the City and, and whether that might have any impact when the two teams meet at the end of the month. Because as I sort of said earlier, it was, it was men against boys last year. But maybe if there's a different perception about City, maybe the dynamic might have shifted this time around. Yeah. And, and there are two things with that. I think it's interesting that City over the last couple of years, I think City, um, not, not, not Pep, particularly, but people behind the scenes at City would admit that they'd become obsessed with Liverpool, become obsessed with Liverpool, become obsessed with, with Klopp. And it was, it was Guardiola, actually, who said in it, the last summer that he wasn't really aware of, of Arsenal. And you make that point about letting them have uh, Gabriel Jesus and, and Zinchenko, that he wasn't really aware that Arsenal were capable of that until there was a pre-season game. I think Arsenal beat Chelsea, was it, was it 4-0 in, in the States? And he said that was a moment where he looked at that result and thought, oh, no. 
a little bit. And, and he said that after that, he wasn't really surprised at how Arsenal had, had started the league, uh, started the, the league season. I think you make a good point that, that there probably was men against boys um, in that game at, at the end of last season. And it certainly appeared that way from, from the press box. And I, and I don't think it's going to be the same kind of feeling when, when the teams meet at the end of March. And the one thing that I think that, that maybe has changed it is probably Declan Rice. You know, that there was a feeling at City maybe that Arsenal were capable of that kind of implosion that we saw. But the way that Pep Guardiola was talking, particularly at the start of the season, about Arsenal's summer business, you could tell that the, the feeling within City and his personal feeling towards Arsenal had probably changed a little bit. And that kind of, the feeling maybe before that game last season, at the end of last season, where City just kind of, in the build of it, just felt like City were waiting to beat them. That it was just a, a case of, let's just wait for the game and we'll beat them and then we'll kind of go on our merry way and win the title. I don't think that it's going to be the same sense heading into that game. At the end of um, at the end of March, I think that that there's a different view probably from City about Arsenal's mentality. And even though they did collapse a little bit at the end of last season, I don't think that they're really thinking about that this season. I think they they do see them now as as a real potential um, title challenger. And I think it's interesting that a lot of the debate around this sort of Klopp leaving. You know, you look at where's the next sort of big rivalry going to come from if you haven't got Klopp. Guardiola, who have you got? And I think it's going to be Guardiola and Arteta. I think there's there's an, an awful lot more respect from City towards Arsenal now than perhaps there was a year ago. And talking yeah. about, do we think that that midfield battle, but if both players are fit, Rodri and Declan Rice, is that where the game is won? Yeah, probably. I mean, I also think Rice, I mean, Rice is a really good a good example of what we're talking about, actually, because obviously City made a bid for him, right? Which was, which is a kind of a, like that whole thing was a bit strange at the time because Arsenal were confident for so long that they were going to get him, and it was a case of just ironing out the, the details, really. And then City sort of came out of nowhere and made, and Rob, you'll know better than me, but I think they made one bid yeah. that was lower than where City were, uh, where Arsenal were at at the time, and then decided to just not follow it up. And if we're talking about the dynamic between the two clubs, it, it maybe that feels like that. If we're you know, talking about it shifting more towards Arsenal being seen as not necessarily equals, because you can't say that about a team that's not won a title for twenty years against a team that's obviously been dominant in, in English football. But the fact that that Arsenal were able to pull that deal off and and effectively beat City to the signing of of well, what's, who is now English football's most expensive player, with along with Bellingham, um, sort of says a lot about about where those two teams are. I mean, whether, yeah, the game probably will be won and lost there, won't it? Because, I mean, Arsenal got totally overrun in midfield. Although, you remember that one of the games up there, was it like, I think it was last season, it was just De Bruyne going long to Haaland, wasn't it? There was a, yeah. they, Guardiola kind of changed that approach where instead of trying to play through teams, he literally just tried to hit Haaland and then play off him. And Arsenal just couldn't cope with it. So actually, if they're going to do that again, then that is going to be the ultimate test of that Saliba Gabriel partnership, isn't it? Absolutely. And you know, is that again? Obviously, when Arsenal they didn't have Saliba uh, that time against Haaland, is that we talk about the Rodri Declan Rice battle being key? But how key is Saliba and and Haaland? We'll talk about a month away. So both players have to be fit. I, I think. You know, when Saliba was missing last season, Arsenal's title challenge basically fell over, didn't it? it just they, they missed him massively and it, they couldn't sustain it. You know, keeping Haaland quiet, difficult. I, I just think you can't boil the Arsenal Man City rivalry now to, you know, one on one battles. I think City's overall power as a team, they have strength in all departments. And I think, I, just getting back to what I just said talking before about the, what the City fear Arsenal more than they used to do, I don't think they do, to be honest. I think the only team that they fear is Liverpool because they know that Liverpool can beat them because they have done that. I, I think. There's an arrogance at City, but that's born out of winning things. It's a confidence and arrogance that they only see one rival. And, you know, as Rob said, they don't particularly like Liverpool, but I think I think, I think they still see Arsenal as being, you know, definitely the third team in the race. And I think whether whether Arsenal can change that perception that in the next few weeks ahead, I don't know. But I think the only way that Arsenal can change that, yes, they've beaten City at the, the Emirates this season. They have to go to the Etihad and win. They have to go to City and beat City on their home patch. And I think if that happens, then that will change the whole perception of everything about Arsenal. But I think right now, I think that they look at that squad and think there's some good players there, but they're not a rival in the sense that Liverpool are. 
probably also shouldn't get hung up on that game completely because we was looking at it this morning and like Arsenal's running. It's a, I mean, they've got some difficult away games, not just City. I mean, I know they've got Sheffield United next, but they've got they've got to go to Brighton. Difficult under the Zerbi. They've got to go to Wolves, playing very well this season. Um, they've got to go to Tottenham at the end of April. And their final away game is at Manchester United. And I know United are, you know, it could be anything these days, wildly unpredictable, but they've won one Premier League game there since 2006. So th- there's some really big tests for Arsenal ahead, um, not just of the City game, but th- that that's kind of why in the predictions we've done for this, I, I just I find it difficult to, to see them last in the pace because they just... They've been really good at breaking down sort of little individual milestones and barriers against teams. But as Bobby said, it's like City away, you just don't see them winning that game. I think there'll be a lot. I don't see it being 4-1. I think it'll be a lot closer. But you don't see them playing with the kind of authority in the probably the toughest stadium in Europe to be able to go and win that game with the title, not necessarily on the line, but certainly up for grabs. And then back it up by going to Spurs and winning and back it up and going to beat United for only the second time in 18 years and go to Brighton, who were very good under Zerbi, and go to... You just... you just City, you see them doing that. Arsenal have never done it. And while they look very good at the moment, that you just don't see them having that consistency under maximum pressure for the next, what, three months, two and a half months. The, the other thing, the other thing with, with Arsenal is that we're, you're talking about something that, obviously, it's not been decided yet, but you're talking about all these horrible away games have gotten and a really pressurised running. The one thing that you can't factor in is, is the Champions League. You know, you'd expect, even though they beat, they, they got beat by Porto, you'd expect them to get through that that tie. But then you get a, a situation in the quarterfinals where they could have they could have City in the quarterfinals. They could have Real Madrid and or, or Bayern Munich. And what a Champions League quarterfinal, a massive Champions League quarterfinal against those massive teams takes out of you. It, it, I mean, you just can't measure that. You know, obviously Liverpool have got a different proposition in that they've got the Europa League to deal with which is a, a grueling competition City have shown last season that they had Bayern Munich in the quarters and Real Madrid in the semis and were still able to stay in the FA Cup and win it and go uh, well, almost unbeaten all the way through the Premier League title race so you've got City who we know can do it, Liverpool who have got something else to deal with and Arsenal who could be faced not only with all these away games against City, Brighton, Tottenham and Man United but also massive two-legged Champions League games against some of the best clubs in Europe. I mean, that's an awful lot to, to deal with when you're chasing a, a first title in, in a long time. Yeah, and that, and that Porto game, I think that raised a lot of familiar concerns, actually. We talk about mentality and delivering under pressure. You know, that was that game, the away game in Porto, they lost 1-0. They didn't have a shot on target for the first time in two years, more than two years. And and they looked inhibited. They 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 didn't play the brave pass. They didn't look as authoritative on the ball. They looked a bit uncertain at the back. And I mean, at the end, you know, giving away the goal as they did, they lost the ball three times basically on the edge of their own box. You know, conceded. Okay, great strike right at the end of the game. But you just sort of think, yeah, that you know, they, and Arteta and a couple of players afterwards sort of complain about you know the number of fouls and. The dark arts and all this, you just think, yeah, well, that's what you're going to get. That you're going, you're going to get that in the Champions League, and you're going to get that from the best sides, you know, in England. And City are the, you know, City, you know we all know City have mastered that particular art very well, um, and, and and that kind of savviness, that sort of that maturity to be able to just handle whatever's thrown at you. You just think, well, Guardiola and City can do it, have done it for years. Klopp certainly can do it. This Liverpool team half of them we know can do it the other half look like they're capable of it and the Arsenal guys you just think well they've got the talent to match these other two but do they do do they have that ability to execute what they're doing now winning games in the league at least by three four five six when the season is at its most acute when the pressure is at its most intense and they didn't do it last year and they've never done it obviously under Arteta and for two decades and that's the big difference, isn't it? And because we know City have done it, and we know Liverpool have been there under Jurgen Klopp. With that in mind, James, and you mentioned predictions, where do you see Arsenal finishing and the other two teams? Who is your one, two, three in this Premier League title race? Well, I, I feel I feel really bad about this because I think we've been quite negative about Arsenal, even though they are flying at the moment. And you know, if they continue to play like they are for the next two and a half months, this is going to look really stupid, guy. But 
you just, you know, everything goes up a gear in March, April, May. Arsenal found that and they weren't able to compete with it. And Rob, yeah, it's a great point, you know, about the Champions League. If they do get through, now they're playing three massive games a week, potentially for three, four, five, six weeks, maybe longer, depending on how far they get. Um, I think, by the way, being out of the FA Cup for Arsenal is a huge blessing in that in that regard. They've got a bit of time now just to recover uh, mentally, but um, I, I don't. I just don't see them finishing anywhere other than third because I think Liverpool will go a long, long way under Klopp, but they're not City. And as boring as it is, five is it five and six? I think it will be six and seven. They've not. I mean, Rob, Rob and Augie have seen them more than I have, but they've not been great really, City. They've not, Arsenal are playing brilliantly now. The champagne football and all this. And you think, well, if you, you know, if you had to pick the title winners tomorrow, you'd think, well, in terms of purely on form and aesthetics and everything else, but you don't win titles on aesthetics. You win it on know-how and execution. And, and you just think City are going to come good. Rob has already outlined in great detail how good they are at this time of the year. So I've said, I think City will win the league. I think Liverpool will finish second and I think Arsenal will be third. I think as as they are now is as it will be. If we get to the end of the season and that is the case, do you think Arsenal will look at that as a disappointing season and will be looking, you know, Mark raised it, is Arteta the man? Do you think that becomes a question if Arsenal finish third? No, I don't. There's There are ways to finish third. It's funny. I was having a conversation with a couple of staff in Porto before the game. And there was a discussion about, well, if they finish third and they, let's say they go to the Champions League semi-finals, is that progress from last season? And I'm not, I'm not sure it is by definition. But equally, I think if they finish third, I don't think you can call it a failure because of just how... You, you, it's easy to forget what a mess that club was before Arteta took charge and when he won the FA Cup, which was kind of came out of nowhere... Um, and really for the first sort of 18 months, two years of Arteta's tenure, they, they have taken, come on leaps and bounds. And it is because of him and all of the work that he's done behind the scenes. You think about even things like the way they've restructured the hierarchy of that club. When Wenger left, they tried to, they appointed nine department heads and tried to diversify all the responsibility to kind of create this infrastructure. So it wasn't solely dependent on the manager because that was the issue they felt they had under Wenger. Well, it's now flipped back in the last few years. It's now... You know, Mikel Arteta with Edu, um, Josh Kroenke, Per Mertesacker heading up the academy. These guys are the, are the absolute hub of that club. And it's, and, and all of the sort of those appointments and, and that di- diversification of responsibility has all been stripped back. It's all come centralised again. And that's because of Arteta. So I, I certainly know for a fact that if they finish third and say they even got knocked out of the Champions League by Porto, there'll be no recrimination internally. They'll feel they're still well-placed to kick on and go again. But I have to say, if they finish third by five points, I think he gets a pass, no questions asked. I think if they're third by 10, 12 points, then you have to say, I think what Oggy was saying then comes into play. I think you'd say, I'm not suggesting that he's not the right man to take them forward, but I think there's serious questions to be asked about how they tailor their performance during the season. You know, Rob sort of said it. Guardiola is the absolute master. And Alex Ferguson was very good at this as well, you know, about being able to tailor performance to execute under the biggest, um, in the biggest games, under the biggest circumstances. I remember talking to Harry Kane about this on a personal level when he was talking about he scored a lot of goals in 2018 in the group stage and then it kind of dried up as, as the tournament went on for England. And what he was trying to do was tailor his performance so that he peaked in the knockout rounds. It's, just, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an elite sports psychology thing that Arsenal have not mastered yet and and if they fall away again then there is there is a two season pattern there that asks some very difficult questions of Arteta but I, d- I certainly don't think his job would be under threat I certainly don't think that um, there would be any sort of fan clamour to see him go there are ways of finishing third and they're finishing second aren't there and then they've certainly got to keep the pedal to the metal for the next couple of months Absolutely. And that moves me on to Liverpool, an, uh, an era that is now coming to an end um, with Klopp. Mark, where do you see them finishing in this title race and who is your one, two, three? Yeah, I mean, just my one, two, three is um, Liverpool, Man City, Arsenal. Just before I talk about Klopp, I just want to add to Arsenal in the sense that 
It's 20 years this year since they won the league for the last time when the Invincibles won it under Wenger. 20 years, I think that's Arsenal's longest ever run with it being champion. So it's a massive run for a club as big as Arsenal. But I think, you know, you, you look at this team now, as promising as it is, I don't think any of these players will get in the Invincibles team. The, that, and that shows you the measure they have to reach a, to be champions. I don't think if you had a combined team of City, Liverpool and Arsenal, there'd be any Arsenal players in it. You know, they'd be close, but there won't be any in it. So that shows how far away they are from the big two, which they are the big two. So, you know, like James said, we have been a bit harsh in Arsenal, but it's it's the reality. And I think, you know, Arteta's future is right. It won't be by Arsenal. But, you know, I know that the Barcelona thing out of the, out of the Grand Reach that when he was asked about it and dismissed it. But if Barcelona come knocking for Mikel Arteta, that is a very hard job to turn down for anybody, never mind a, a Spanish guy. But, you know, that, that's by the way, let's part that there. Let's just kind of leave that hanging out there. But Barcelona, much bigger club than Arsenal. Anyway, my, my top three, I've, I've gone for Liverpool because because of what I said earlier, they've got they've got the pedigree, they've got they've got Klopp, they've got Anfield, and I just think that they've got a bit of momentum now, which just takes them ahead of City. I think you know nobody's ever won four in a row before, and there's a reason for it. It's hard, you know, it's a tough thing to do, and I think the City probably the best equipped team to do it. But I just think Liverpool have got the extra edge, and I think yes, there are potential pitfalls in the sense that the pressure might become too heavy on Klopp and, and the players, but I just haven't seen any evidence of that. I think the way they run the club and motivates the players, it, it will give them that extra extra lift. So. I'm going to say Liverpool win the league, City finish second, and Arsenal a distant third. And Mark, whether they win it or they don't, whichever way it falls, or if it falls that way, where do you? How do you see winning the title and not winning the title? How does that impact Klopp's legacy at Liverpool, or does it not impact it at all? Well, I mean, obviously, I mean the guy's legacy is absolutely secure at Liverpool. Everybody loves him there. You know, he has been one of the most you know iconic figures in the Premier League era. I think he's brought something different to the Premier League and he's as a club. So it won't damage his legacy. I think only improve it. I think the, the question is if you're the guy that's coming in to replace him, how do you top what Klopp's done? So I suppose if you're Klopp's success, you probably want, want them to finish second so you don't have to follow a guy that's won the league and maybe four trophies. But I, I just think Klopp's you know, legacy is secure. He's one of Liverpool's greatest ever managers and that that is a, a big thing to say considering the success they've had in the past. But yeah, I, I think it, it makes no difference to his legacy. He'll be... He'll be carried out of their, you know, shoulder high no matter what happens this season because they love him at Liverpool. Rob, you you said, you know, there's no stopping City in this title race now and this is where they're coming to their own. Obviously, you see them as winning the title. Where do you see the position in fall between Liverpool and Arsenal? Yeah, I, mean, I just can't look beyond City. I mean, everything, all the evidence points to City winning it again. Um after that, I think that Arsenal will finish second and Liverpool will, will finish third. Um, that's based purely on the fact that I think that Arsenal have got a stronger group than Liverpool. Um, you know, obviously the injuries, Mark's right in that not all the, these injuries that they've got, they're not going to all be out until the end of the season. So, you know, the likes of Salah and, um, and Alisson and, um, and Nunez, you'd expect to be back pretty quick. But they, they are looking like quite a, a thin group beyond that and, and you've still got players like Alexander Arnold who's not going to be back for a while um, Jota who won't be back for a while James is right that, that at the moment right now Arsenal probably are the, the, the best team in, in England um, I wouldn't expect their drop off to be as pronounced as it was last year because you would expect them to learn from that experience and, and maybe fare a little bit better so I think City will win I think in the end it'll be one of those that might look quite comfortable when you see the final table in, in May that City just kind of motor through these games and, and they win by you know maybe five or six points Arsenal to finish second and, and then Liverpool to finish third but but to collect other trophies after the Carabao Cup and, and Klopp gets his send-off um, I, ju I just can't in terms of the title I just can't see anyone stopping City which is clearly going to look very very stupid when, when someone does but right sat here now I just can't see anyone pipping City OK, guys, so there you have the predictions from our reporters. But what do you think? Will Arteta finally get Arsenal over the line? Or will Klopp's final season at Anfield finish on a high? Or is the inevitable going to happen? Pep Guardiola's formidable City charge to their full successive title. Hit subscribe and let us know what you think in the comments below.